a sophomore Feb here at Middlebury College, uh, where I study socio-ecological studies and landscape architecture. Um, and I'm very excited to be introducing tonight's guest speaker, uh, the seed huntress, uh, Sephra Alexandra, who is an endurance race, race ethnobotanist on a hunt to preserve the biodiversity of our wild and cultivated lands through seed conservation. Uh, she is the leader of the Ecotype Project, which we're going to learn about tonight, uh, the goal of which is to ampl amplify the amount of truly local native seed available for ecological restoration, uh, creating the first eco-regional seed supply chain in the Northeast. Uh, in 2020, she began Boat botanical.org, uh, where she guides expeditions that are, uh, as she says, paddling for the pollinators, uh, planting native plants by boat along riparian corridors. Um, Sephra holds her MAT in agroecological agro education from Cornell University. Uh, she is a fellow of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, a Wings World Quest expedition flag carrier, member of the Explorers Club, and runs a wilderness skills school, the Readiness Collective, with her twin brother. So as you can see, uh, she's a really uh, special and amazing person that we're so excited to have with us tonight. Um, this uh, revolutionary initiative, the Ecotype Project, is what got me first involved with native plants and excited about it. Um, and we're, we're very excited to share that with you tonight. Uh, it really represents a model for grassroots bottom-up conservation initiatives that benefit the people at the heart of local e ecosystems, along with pollinators and biodiversity. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Sephra. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, Bethany and Fran and Jan and Brett. Um, I love Vermont. I've lived up in Vermont for periods of my life. So hi to all of you and all of the beautiful corners of such an amazing state. Um, Brett was definitely a shining beacon of when he was still in high school, when he started joining the Eco Type Project. And I was like, are all high school kids as smart as you are now? I think he's a uh, he is a, a rare seed indeed. So um, it's a delight to see how much of a community has been built up there around all this. And I am excited to take you all on a great seed safari. So we will begin with... Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so here we are now um, in Vermont in Middlebury Garden Club and Pollinator Pathways. I can't say enough about it. Um, Donna Merrill is a good friend because um, she's down in the Connecticut way who started the Pollinator Pathway. And really the work of the Pollinator Pathway and all the education and outreach that that has done has paved the way for so many garden clubs and land trusts and people to be interested in native plants and want to support the pollinators and um, was really kind of our our gateway to being able to do this work. So what I'm going to do for you is paint the picture of what seed conservation looks like globally. Um, so internationally around the world, how seed conservation works nationally, and then we'll go locally to the Ecotype Project. I just want you all to have a framework of, of the different strategies that are utilized to preserve the beautiful arcs of biodiversity. So as Brett said, I call myself the seed huntress. I figured botany needed a little bit of marketing, and um, it's it's been really fun to help spread the word and the message about the importance of preserving and rewilding our shared landscapes. So I just want to start this talk, and my slides are advancing slowly, but um, if we just take a second, and um, I sit on the unceded lands of the Pagasset Golden Hill Tribe, beautiful stewards of a landscape here in Connecticut where they used to do seasonal burning and um, safeguard these huge masting nut trees and the chestnuts and the deer would frolic and all of the oysters and mussels on our coast were just so healthy and thriving. And um, it's really important to think about stewardship of place. And when we look at these beautiful seeds, these exquisite and elegant, uh, you know, the most elegant architecture. And if you can distill an oak tree down to an acorn, it's just amazing to hold these embryos, these, these living, breathing things. So I come um, to the work of seeds with such deep respect for, you know, the fact that these are the living diversity of our landscapes. And 
There's a lot of great work around seed sovereignty. Rowan White is a beautiful poet. She's Haudenosaunee and really has helped articulate this, this deep reverence and respect that we need to have when we're doing seed work, that the, these are our kin from the plant kingdom, right? And um, I just wanna preface it that way, that when, when I'm doing this and I'm helping spread seeds and helping to conserve seeds, it's really with, with a deep amount of reverence and respect. So as we move forward, um, and the slides go slowly. Um, I want to first show you, there was a gentleman, Nikolai Vavilov, a Russian ethnobotanist explorer, who was the first person who was really traveling around the globe. And he was looking at seeds and he was noticing um, crop wild relatives, right? So the wild relatives or the wild species that over thousands of years of stewardship have become our cultivated agricultural crops. And what he noticed was where these crops first emerge in the world is where they have greatest centers of diversity. So you have maize and wheat in southern Mexico, potatoes in Peru, pulses and grains in India. And you can start to look at our global map of where these foods and forageable um, uh, seeds really first emerged. And he was the first person that started banking those seeds saying, hey, these are our painter's palette of, uh, of food security, nutritional diversity, of safeguarding our wild lands. And what that led to is our global seed banking system. So if you um, see this next map that's going to be coming up here, what this map is showing you is where our global seed banks, so ex situ is the fancy Latin word for meaning uh, where when seeds are safeguarded and stored away from the places that they grow, right? Out of the soil. And when you see those little vials that have the seeds in it and they're in the cold storage areas, or maybe some of you have heard of Svalbard, the global seed vault up in Norway, which is this black box repo repository um, that safeguards each of these big seed bank seeds. So in Syria, when their seed bank was bombed, if there wasn't a backup of those heritage grains, all of the genetics that have been stewarded um, since time immemorial would have, would have been lost. So they were able to retake those seeds out of Svalbard and re-multiply them to re-safeguard those genetics. And so I, uh, the Crop Trust is the organization in Germany that oversees this whole system. And um, I was chosen as a Gene Bank Impacts Fellow. And so went to the seed bank in Fiji and did field work all around the South Pacific studying this beautiful crop Taro, Colacasia esculenta. And what happened in 1993 was the South Pacific's version of the Irish potato famine. Although it looked like they had all these different varieties of taro that had red stems or yellow stems or bigger leaves or smaller leaves, because these plants are all vegetatively propagated, meaning you take a cutting, you replant, you take a cutting, you replant, they actually all were basically a monoculture. They had one genetic strain. So when this blight, this phytophthora came through, within six weeks, all of their fields were wiped out. So again, like Nikolai Vavilov, the ethnobotanical explorers had to go back out to those centers of origin, regather that diversity and rebreed lines that were both resistant to the blight and palatable to the, you know, the beautiful mothers in Samoa cooking this totem crop, this crop that is utilized in rituals of birth and life and death and marriage and ceremony and um, uh, truly an ethnobotanical cultural totem. So the loss of it uh, had a massive impact both on their economy and on their culture. So after these lines were rebred and safeguarded at the at CPAC, which is the um, Center for Pacific Crops and Trees, when Nigeria then experienced that same blight, they were able to deploy those blight resistant strains and you're able to stave off famine as taro is the 14th most eaten vegetable in subsistence farming nations. So um, it really is a testament to show that we need to preserve these arcs of diversity globally because you never know which blight or which pest or which climate shift is happening and preserving the diversity of place, these bioregionally adapted seeds allows us to have hopefully the genetics to be able to rebreed, to adapt to whichever, whatever happens and whatever shifts. So that's our global seed banking system. Um, now, my twin brother and I and his partner, we run uh, a business called Tactivate, which is a disaster response and preparedness. 
I actually just got back from Ukraine a few days ago, and I advise from a food security perspective. So here is what's known as a community seed bank in Haiti. So this is the Southern Department of Haiti, where unfortunately they experience man-made and natural disasters quite frequently. And so for them, they you know, are not accessing those huge ex situ seed banks. What they have, if we can fortify it, is a community seed bank. So this wonderful gentleman, um, the agronom Elie saint magloire he's the head farm manager that oversees 25 farm managers, and then they oversee thousands of smaller hold farm managers. So when a hurricane comes whipping through and their fields get wiped out, if they can look to this resource to immediately replant their fields, then that provides them with food security, seed sovereignty, and it's a self-facilitated, regenerative, almost permaculturian form um, of relief. Now, what usually happens is these big NGOs with great intentions will bring rice grown in North Carolina, which Haitians call Miami rice, which is donated for free. And what that does is could bring in pests, non-viable seed, because that rice is saying like, we don't know how to grow here. We're from North Carolina. Um, and also undercuts the agroeconomic system of rice farmers up north that say, hey, we still have rice and now everyone's relying on this free seed. So if we can fortify these community seed banks that are locally accessible with bioregionally adapted seed, the seed that knows how to grow there, that the folks um, like the taste of and so forth, um, it's a really important resource. So that is disaster response. So um, again, I'm going to go through these next slides um, quickly, but you know, the 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 relationship with from an ethnobotanical perspective of of people and place and the food and fiber and medicine that they rely on is perhaps you know to use the word sacred, right? That is a, it, it is such an important and imperative relationship that it needs to be maintained, and all of this seed work needs to be done in that vein to give people the dignity to be able to um, caretake and steward their lands with what has been there since time immemorial. And so in that effort, um, whenever you're sourcing your seeds or looking to different seed companies like High Mowing up in Vermont, there's a lot of these seed companies that have taken a safe seed pledge that says, we are using open source seeds that can be shared and distributed that don't have patents on them. Um, and so you wanna make sure if whenever you're looking to purchase seeds that they've, it's so the company that signed the safe seed pledge and also the open source seed initiative. That just means that these seeds can be um, freely shared without any uh, legal restriction. That's another conversation, but as we're in the vein of seeds, I just wanted to preface that in this arena. So now that we get um, more to the ecological restoration side of things, in 2014, a lot of the federal agencies said, hey, listen, we're dealing with like a lot of wildfires and hurricanes and all of these different, um, even anthropocentric effects on our landscape that um, we need to do restoration. We need to be able to replant and regenerate these lands, but we don't have any local seed and there's really no infrastructure in place to make local seed available. So what was created is known as the National Seed Strategy. So you have the BLM and the Forest Service and all these folks saying, we need to figure out a plan where we can get seeds from the wild into production, stored, and being able to be distributed um, to have the right plant genetic material to do the work we need to do where it needs to be done. So um, before we go any further, it's always helpful. Um, I know even as Brett reads my bio, I like to use really big ecological fancy science terms, but sometimes a little bit of clarification is helpful. So. We have um, a native species, right? And an often accepted definition of that is that it occurs naturally in a particular region um, without direct or indirect actions of modern humans. Of course, there's debates since glaciation, there's you know a, a very large whole conversation that goes around that, but for now, we'll use that definition. Uh, a nativar, if you think of a cultivar, that's when people are like, I like how high that plant is. I like the color of those flowers. There's different almost aesthetic characteristics that you're selecting for, but just like we saw with the taro in the South Pacific, oftentimes in the nursery trade, you're taking cuttings and you're just repropagating that same genetic line over and over again. What that does is that makes you really susceptible to 
um, pests or any shifts in climate that um, that certain genetic strain uh, may be vulnerable to. So we really want to promote you know, um, safeguarding and proliferating as much genetic diversity as possible. So when we talk about an ecotype, um, the project that I lead, the ecotype project, what we're talking about is the truly local wild plants that have adapted since time immemorial with the pollinators in place, right? That specific genetics to that place. And that is those locally specific native plant materials. Um, and again, from a restoration perspective, this is what is most genetically appropriate when you want to be putting the right plants in the right place. So um, hopefully that helps clarify some of those words that get often interchanged improperly. So let's look at the plant hardiness zone because I know that there is a question around that. Oftentimes when we're thinking of agriculture or planting, people know the USDA plant hardiness zone, which is there's 13 zones um, in the US and they are based on 10 degree differences of what their minimum um, coldest winter temperature is, right? And so it, in Vermont, if you're, 4A or 4B, that's when you break it down into um, differences of five degree increments. And, you know, this is a useful framework in some ways, because you want to make sure if you're getting fruit trees or perennials that they're hardy to your coldest weather. But from our perspective, when we talk about native plants, um, we really rely on a different framework, which is what I'll show you. Um, you know, the, the hardiness zone doesn't really take into account daylight hours, summer temperatures, frost free days and so forth. So it does have its limitations. So at the Ecotype project, um, the first time I saw this map, I shed a few tears because it, it makes so much sense. If we put our bug eyes on, right? When we're flying over this landscape, we don't see where Connecticut ends and where Massachusetts begins. We see the riparian corridors. We see the broadleaf forests. We see the coastal zones. And so this wonderful gentleman at the EPA, James Omernick, um, he worked for the military and he knew soils so well that he could say the planes could land here, the troops could land there. And he had been working in conservation and he found that the hydrologists, the people um, working with water were working off a certain data set and the ornithologists, those you know, working in bird conservation were working off a slightly different data set and the forestry folks and geology, all of these different um, sciences were working off of slightly different um, you know, frameworks. And he said, if we truly want to do restoration ecology, we need to work off of a shared framework. So what an eco-regional map is, is broad stroke artistic overlays of those different data sets. Is it perfect? No. Is it a great framework to work off of? Absolutely. So what you're working, um, at, what, what this is really is it's a, it's a spatial unit to be able to identify these biogeographical assemblages of your, you know, uh, of, of the biodiversity array that is on this landscape. And so what we work off of at the Ecotype Project is a level three. Just for reference, this is a level four, right? So with more funding and as this becomes more sophisticated, hopefully one day we could have 59F for more of the coastal areas. And as you can see there in Vermont, you have um, eco region 58 and just a, a little bit of 83. Um, a lot of the work in, in what I'm gonna show you as how we framed out um, our model here in Connecticut is hopefully to be able to be a replicable model throughout all these different eco regions to be able to adapt. So those are eco regions in the framework that we utilize. So. Um, so just in reference, cause we get these questions a lot, right? It's like better to worse. So, um, with an eco region, with an eco regional framework, that's your ideal situation. If we could create, which I'll show you these, these seed sheds, right? Instead of looking to our watersheds, what are our seed sheds where seeds can be collected and saved and grown and shared all in that area? You know, once we can have a resource that has eco region 83, eco region 58, that's great. Um, that would be your ideal best choice because that is what is best suited for the ecology of your local area. Um, 
that is not always available. And as we'll see, that's fine. Um, if you want to do the best you can and be sourcing as locally as you can. So when you can't find those plants from directly in your eco region, try to find the next closest one or be getting those same species that support those ecological functions. Again, native ours would be the next you know, less best, I don't think that's proper grammar choice, um, just because of that, you know, genetic um, bottleneck that we talked about. Uh, we all here, I'm sure love plants. And there is, there is a place for those ornamental, those beautiful plants, but let's make sure that as Edwina von Gaal's initiative says, we leave, you know, two thirds for the birds. We make sure we have enough on our landscape to support um, pollination services and habitat. And then let's try to avoid invasive species. So this comes from Lydia Pan at Wild Ones, which is a great organization that proliferates this type of um, knowledge and education. So here we find ourselves in the Eastern United States and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank is the seed bank that safeguards um, the ecotypes for the New York City boroughs, right? So Ed Toth, who leads that, was running Greenbelt Native Plant Center, and that was who was producing all the ecotypic native plant materials for all the New York City parks. And what they did is they conducted um, a survey throughout the Eastern United States of all of those industries and folks that are utilizing native plants. So from people who work in restoration to pollinator support, wildlife habitats, um, stewardship, you know, different landscapers, all of these different industries, they said, what do you prefer to use? And 74% 70 of those people said, we want ecotypic plants. We want truly local native genetics to do our work. The problem was, is that's only available 15% of the time. So what this map is showing you is all of those red dots, right? The ecotypes are almost never available in those areas. The first closest resource would be 400 miles away and then 800 miles away. So just like we had this massive kind of awakening in terms of our local food movement where we want to know our farmers, we want to be buying within food sheds, we want to be supporting that local agrarian um, regenerative agricultural culture. Now we really want to have that same conversation around knowing our nurserymen, knowing and women, um, knowing you know, where seeds are collected, where they're grown and where they're shared. So Ken Green from the Hudson Valley Seed Company coined this term seed sheds, right? So now um, let's all know our seed sheds like we all know our watersheds. And this can really help to fortify our corridors and reduce the, you know, especially down here in Connecticut, not as much up in Vermont, very fragmented landscapes. Um, as another point of reference, we do sit in the United Nations Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. So there actually is money globally to be doing these type of restoration projects. But as um, I presented on this panel for um, the International Network for Seed-Based Restoration, all of these people all over the world, in Ireland and Africa and, and everywhere, they're all asking the same questions. How do we fortify a truly local native seed supply chain? So um, the Society of Ecological Restoration, as I just mentioned, is a wonderful organization. And what they did is they put out this special issue for standards for native seeds and ecological restoration because the agricultural and horticultural trades have strict and stringent regulations and templates and forms for ensuring germination and purity and all of these um, different things. So when you're buying those seeds, you know what you're getting, but really, for native seeds, um, it really hasn't been formalized yet. So what they're trying to do with this issue is create, as you see, templates that can be shared amongst a community of practice globally to try to create that framework around native seeds so that um, you know that when you're purchasing it for these restoration projects, you actually know what you're getting because native seeds um, certainly act um, very differently than, you know, agricultural seeds, which all, you know, germinate in five days and then fruit in 30 days and so forth. Native seed has a different survival strategies for a number of reasons we'll talk about in a bit. So here I am back in Connecticut and um, 
working for the uh, CT NOFA, so the Northeast Organic Farming Association. I know you all have a great NOFA up in Vermont. And you say, well, what is a farming um, organization? You know, why, why should they care about pollinators? Well, if you look at the blueberries um, on the left, they have not been properly pollinated and the ones on the right have been. So as our executive director and longtime farmer, Dina Brewster says, she says, these pollinators are paying our wages, right? Um, and if they don't have the food and habitat that they need, well, friends, then we don't have the food and habitat and local food security that we need. So it's imperative that um, we make sure that that's on farm. So we um, got a USDA specialty crop block grant where our specialty crop was this native seed. So what started out as a pollinator health initiative, that's what we thought it would be. Once we started doing some research, we realized this is actually a seed amplification initiative, because if we want to put this pollinator habitat on farm, well, we need to start producing this seed because that resource doesn't exist. So the impetus behind this project is to rewild the living seed bank, right? So we talked about our ex situ seed banks, and now we're talking about in situ, which just means in the soil. So if you think about the seeds in those vaults, they're like dusty books, and the ones in the soil are ever adapting, increasing their vigor, um, you know, to the changing climates and the beneficial insects and the pests and so forth. So that's really the ultimate place where we want to have our seeds be in that in that seed bank profile. And um, the fancy word for the seed supply chain that we're developing is, um, it's really called native plant materials development. So how can we develop these to be more readily available? And what we realized is we need people to grow this out. And these organic farmers are uniquely positioned as allies of conservation. So the great part about this project is we all have a seat at the table, as you'll see. And finally, farmers and folks in conservation can be having, um, you know, a, a hybridized or it can be having a, a conversation and can be um, facilitating the needs of what, what the other groups need. So we looked at the organic farmers and say, hey, they're producers of these supply chains. Um, and then we set out to make a replicable model uh, for this work. So Again, as stated, um, Donna Merrill and all of the wonderful people at the Pollinator Pathway had made kind of, you know, the monarch butterfly and milkweed, the cool kids, and everyone wants to get involved with this. And everyone realizes, even if you just have a, a little spot by your mailbox or a pot outside your door or the tiniest little patch, you know, in a community garden or anywhere, it really helps to create these ecological corridors and reduce our fragmentation and rewild these areas um, as pathways for the pollinators. So I can't think you know, the pollinator pathway enough and the Addison County um, pollinator pathway for all the work that you do and getting um, everyone excited about this type of work. So that all is well and good, but how do we get um, what seed from the wilds and into cultivation and then being able to be available when you can see that landscape that's been burnt or whatever's happened to it, how do we do this? Right, so we can see that you have to go and collect the seed. Um, then we have to grow out that seed, and then you need to test that seed to make sure, hey, is this actually viable? Is this actually going to grow? Then you need to clean it, which is a whole party, and then you store it and make sure that it can be dispersed when needed, where needed. So we took this from the Society of Ecological Restoration, and we formulated the Ecotype Project simplified version of it which starts with our botanists who wild collect seed. Um, and we're gonna talk about kind of more specifically what that looks like, but um, we find our seed collectors and our botanists who will identify a species and they will go out um, to a truly wild stand um, that's large enough and uh, they will do their seed collections. And then we find organic farmers and get them to grow out those seeds in row crops. And then we have our seed collectors come collect those seeds and we give it to our nursery growers and partners who propagate them and make them available for the end users for the pollinator pathways and the land trust and the garden clubs. And then our eco-regional ecology thrives. So 
as we actually put that into practice and find the folks who can do it, um, it gets a bit more interesting. Sorry, my slides are advancing slowly. Okay, so here's Jordy Elkins, one of our made seed collectors in the project. And one of the things as we're having this conversation and getting everyone all throughout you know, the Northeast excited about this, when we talk about seed collection, what we're not promoting is that everyone now gets really excited and goes out into these last vestiges of these wild places and starts collecting this seed because this is really such a beautiful natural resource and it needs to be handled appropriately and properly. So as a seed collector, you need to make sure that you have the right permission to be collecting from the landscape that you go to, that you're collecting from a population large enough that the seed collection that you're doing won't uh, wipe out that wild population. You need to make sure that you're identifying your species properly, that you're using um, sustainable wild seed collections, and that you have the right training to actually know how to do what you're doing. Because again, that beginning slide, these are these living beings that you know at one seed can produce thousands so each one of them are so valuable and important so those wild seeds the fancy term for that that first generation or from that that seed that comes from the wild is the f0 population okay so um the seeds of success um in the seeds of success was started by um the blm as a way to say we need to do these wild collections of seeds, but we need a provenance, we need a data sheet to go along with these seed collections so that we can make sure whoever the seed collectors are, that they're um, taking GPS coordinates, that they're taking herbaria, dried specimens to be submitted to their state botanist and to the Smithsonian for safeguarding, that they're you know, taking notes as to the soil type and where they're found so that they can be matched with the best sites that they can be utilized on. So this is the SOS protocols. And I have, you know, the Mona Lisa down there taking a selfie, but it's just really a way to say, just like we care about, you know, the provenance of art, let's start caring about the provenance of seed. So I worked on um, a seeds of success collection team out in Idaho, where you know, we would hike miles into the wilderness to go find Draba Hitchcockii, which only grows on these, you know, escarpment cliffs in, in the largest rattlesnake territories um, in, in Idaho. And I would, you know, send pictures of my duct taped cardboard, you know, snake gators to my dad, who was really unimpressed. And the next day somehow got snake gators to me in the wilderness. But you really do, um, as a seed huntress, you start to really realize the personality of these plants. You can see I'm scouting a, a population of Primula alkalina that just grows along these bubbling brooks. And there are these plants that only grow in a certain clay drip and not five feet next door. So you realize um, how beautiful and varied and specific these native plant, um, you know, growing mediums can be. So the, the, the place where these wild, um, you know, native seeds are safeguarded is at the Millennium Seed Bank at the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew, which you can see down there in the corner. Those big seed banks I showed you before, those are where agricultural crops are safeguarded. So that's where our wild seeds um, nationally and internationally are stored. So for the ecotype project, um, these are the species that we so far have in the pipeline. We have 17 species. Again, that's just um, by how much funding that we have and have available because there is certainly a price that goes into doing the seed collections and growing those seeds out and um, cleaning them and so forth. And so, you know, we have um, beautiful asters and three milkweeds. Um, we have the Joe pie weed and the, the foxglove beard tongue and cardinal flower, the monkey flower, the wild bergamot that smells so good. And you can see um, that bee's getting his buzz on. <laughs> All of my jokes are lame ecology jokes. Um, and you can see we have three mountain mints, um, the black eyed Susan, the goldenrod and blue stem working with grasses other than Forbes is a whole nother, you know, do we put down landscape fabric? How do we actually grow these things out? Which I'll show you what we're using, but, um, and then the ironweed. And so you can see that picture, um, our, our farmers, uh, Jean and Abby at the Hickories, which is one of our main sites for production, um, they said, 
where are the pollinators on the 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 black eyed susan we we don't see any pollinators what's going on here and one night they went out at night and they said oh there's night pollinators so not only are we interested in pollinators throughout the day but we also need to be throughout the season but we're also thinking about them at night and i think i might have skipped over some slides because let's see um so the Wild Seed Project, which is up in Maine, which is run by the wonderful Heather McCargo, she puts out a beautiful publication, which makes, I know I'm kind of title waving you all with a lot of this information, but what she does is she makes a lot of these concepts just beautifully displayed and really easy to understand. So what this image is showing you is saying when we're putting in these founder plots, which I'll show you what those are, when we're growing out these different species, we want to be taking into account that we have species that are blooming throughout the season, right? As this wonderful woman from the South, um, I heard her speak and she said, it's like inviting house guests over for a week and only feeding them on Monday, y'all. You know, she's like, we got to make sure that we have food um, from early spring to late fall and all throughout. So that is definitely a consideration. So what is this founder plot that I keep referencing? Well, that F0, that wild seed that you saw Jordy collecting, um, that then gets grown into a plug. And then 200 of that species are planted in a row crop, just like you would grow out your cucumbers or your tomatoes, right? So you can see in those founder plots, you have Joe pie weed on the left and the New York ironweed on the right. And um, what this does is this produces what's known as the F1 generation, right? So that first generation of seed, because there's actually laws that say you can't sell that wild seed directly from the wilds. It helps protect those wild seeds. You have to amplify it and grow it out. So now from these 200 plugs, right? I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but from 200 seeds, I'm now collecting millions off of that Joe pie weed, right? So the ROI of seed is quite encouraging. And this makes it really easy from a seed collection um, standpoint that to have these planted in these you know, monocultural rows. But as we said before, these have large arcs of diversity because when we're collecting, we're putting all of the wild genetics that are um, from those wild populations and making sure we don't do any selection. We make sure that we collect our seeds when early, middle, and late. So I'll show you slides of what that looks like. But, um, you know, having these founder plots on farm, these are just a symphony of ecology now. There's just insects I didn't even know existed that like camouflage and petals and lace wings. And like, you, you just can't imagine how alive and vibrant these are. And from a farm perspective, the more diversity of these species you have, the more diversity of beneficial insects you have. From an organic farming perspective, that's really helpful um, in you know, increasing your yields and providing local food security and those ecosystem services. So um, here are some of our farmers that are part of the project. We're working all over Connecticut. Um, there's a great, uh, in New Hallville, New, near New Haven, Connecticut, there's um, an, urban, an urban farm and nursery, which actually doing seed production in the urban environment is actually preferred because when you're putting those founder plots in, one of the things you have to consider is isolation distances, right? You don't want to have your Joe pie weed next to the wild Joe pie weed um, that could have been sourced from Ernst or somewhere else like that you wanna make sure they're isolated. So the, the urban uh, corridors make a great landscape for doing this type of work, but um, which is something that I didn't quite say. You know, oftentimes when we're buying our seeds, we rely on these Prairie Moon and these Ernst and, and you know, these big seed companies out in the Midwest. And um, what that does is it's, you know, if we're saying, okay, well, you know, milkweed's a milkweed. Well, not really, you know, a monarch has a five-year migration. And if it looks like, oh, we have so many monarchs on this crop, but that crop's bloom times is slightly adapted to a different part of the country. Well, then they miss the bloom times all the way down the coast. So are we actually benefiting them or is it doing a disservice? So that's, you know, another reason why we want to promote um, this native plant materials development to make these plants available locally. So um, it's been great having all these farmers come on board, but then the farmers are saying, I've never grown perennial plants. I don't know how to grow natives. How do I even you know, collect seeds and do all of this? 
So um, what we did is we created these beautiful um, boxes, eight and a half by 11 boxes that you can see over in the right hand side. And we made these protocol cards. What are the general growing, um, you know, uh, protocols you need to be thinking about? What are our seed saving protocols? What do we need to be thinking about for these multi-year plantings? What are the planting guidelines? Uh, you know, and what are the specific needs beyond that for each of the species that we're working with? So all of these cards that I'm going to show you are available as free downloadable PDFs on the Ecotype Project website. But you can see, for example, here's our New York ironweed. Okay, that's what the flower looks like. This is the type of soil that it likes. These are the beneficial insects you can um, hope to see in association with it. Um, it's just kind of like those world wildlife cards where you get like your panda insert, your porcupine, you know, it's, it's specific to these different species. And you start to learn the nuance of working with all of these different, you know, personalities of plants. And then we have these log cards because this is a living document. It's not perfect, but we're saying, let's all start showing what we learned and what happened so that we can put together a best practices. So Here's the Joe pie weed going to seed, right? So seeds, they're, they're a fruit and they have their peak ripeness. And what you can see where that hand is, is that fluffy part that's half fluffy and half not. So that fluffy part is ready to be collected, right? So what we can do is we can shake that fluffy part off into the bag because seeds have all these different dispersal mechanisms and animacori is dispersal by wind. So, you know, if you could just blow on it and the seeds blow off, that that seed's perfectly ripe and ready. You want to collect it a little bit sooner than that. You're going to have Joe pie weed all over your farm. But um, what we do is we leave those stems as long as possible, right? Those are their Miami condos for the winter. We don't want to break off those stems and leave it as high as we can, but we'll come back and we'll do seed collection again, right? Just like you would any other crop, you're going for peak ripeness. So uh, we want to make sure, as I said, that we're capturing the genetics of the seeds that go to seed earliest, that big collection in the middle, and then the ones that go latest, just so we can preserve those arcs of diversity. So after we collect the seed, we want to desiccate it or dry it out, right? You want to get that moisture content out of it. And then we actually have to get it germination tested to make sure it's viable. Uh, and so just to give you some eyes on what some of these other crops look like going to seed, here's your ironweed. You can see that picture in the middle. If you tried kind of pulling on those tufts, those pappuses, like that fluffy stuff you see when you see dandelions flying around, they wouldn't pull out, right? But when they look like that very open pom-pom all the way in that corner, that seed's ready to go. So then the, the flip side of the card that I showed you, it says, um, this is how big the seeds are. This is what they look like. This is when you can hope to be doing your seed collection. It's a bit nuanced and different for different parts of um, the Northeast. But, um, you know, if any of you have ever done seed collection, sometimes you're like looking at your hand, you're like, is that the seed? Is that the seed? I don't know. Maybe that's the seed. So these are helpful just from an identification perspective, right? And again, we have that log to be able to be keeping track. Um, you know, our, our other founder plots that are a bit farther north have their plants are going to seed at a different time. So it's just, it's really interesting to look at it from that perspective. Uh, here's another one, the Joe pie weed. And you can see that picture down in the bottom, right? Right. That's looking a little moldy. We're going to leave that for the birds and we'll, we'll leave that for nature, right? You, you don't want to be collecting it when it's too far gone. So there is that sweet spot um, in seed collection. The Penstemon digitalis has a really interesting smell to it, but it's just this beautiful pod. And it's just amazing how many seeds are actually in every pod. You know, uh, the Penstemon germination and viability is actually pretty low. So it's a survival strategy, right? They make a ton of seed, but not all of it's viable because oftentimes it's eaten or, you know, native seed out in the wild doesn't have as good of a chance when we're cultivating it and making sure they're each preciously taken care of. So after we collect it, then we get to go ahead and clean it. And so you can see just um, an inexpensive car mat from a hardware store. Uh, and after those seeds are dried out, if they were still wet and you tried rubbing them, you're breaking that seed open. And so after they're dried out, they're hardened a bit. Now, from a home scale perspective, you could just take these seeds and replant them out. Don't even worry about cleaning off the, the pappus or the hairiness. But because we're making these commercially available, we go through the process of cleaning them. So we rub off that pappus, and then you can see those different sieves 
um, that are used in soil science a lot. And if you can find the right combination of sieves or some people go to dollar stores and buy every colander and tea strainer. And it really does take a bit of investigation to figure out what works best for actually getting that seed to be clean and, um, removing the plant that the chaff and all the other plant matter. But, um, after you figure it out, you can do it a lot more rapidly, but for our scale and trying to make, you know, being able to provide municipalities and, you know, departments of transportation with seed, we were able to invest in this beautiful thing called the winnow wizard. So the winnow wizard, even though it looks like a DIY home Depot type, um, invention there's a, a great gentleman frank morton who has wild garden seed who used to be on grateful dead tour and then became a lettuce breeder so he has like tie-dyed lettuce purple lettuce like the craziest lettuce you've ever seen and the gentleman who works on his farm was like really sick of cleaning all that lettuce seed with a with a clipper and so he invented this so you can see that top hopper you drop the seeds down then it's an agitator and you can change the wind modulation in the screens and the heavier viable seed will drop down into that first bucket in the chaff like you would traditional winnowing blows off. Again, as we want to preserve as much diversity as possible, we put a little bit of that lighter seed back in. Um, but if we're really talking about fortifying the seed supply chain, we need to be able to have a seed extractory. Out west in Idaho, they have, or in Oregon rather, they have a huge extractory where all the federal agencies send their seed and it's quickly cleaned here we don't have that. So now that's, you know, that's a, a great need that we have. Um, so after all of that work, then we partner with, with the nursery folks and we make um, these native, these ecotypic plant materials available. We, you know, put in this beautiful, our little label that has the ecotype project. And when you see that, you realize it's a socially conscious brand, right? When you see that, you know, that uh, we have a commercial co-venture with these nurseries and a, a bit of that money is going back in to helping get more species through the production chain and so forth. Rather than just relying solely on grants, this is a much more regenerative economic model. Um, and you can know that the seed was provenanced and sustainably wild collected. It was organically grown out and then used with OMRI certified, um, you know, the best practices in the nursery trade as well. So this is our way that we're um, making, you know, this ever, the ever increasing demand, we're actually making the supply available. So, um, and then in terms of ecological restoration, you know, as I said before, the, your ROI of seed, you plant one and you, and then you plant a row of 200 and you're literally collecting millions, right? And then you're able to provide this resource field to put the right plants back in the right place with this truly genetically appropriate material. It's just like we harvest our heirlooms for what we like and what does well in our gardens while our pollinator friends have been doing the same thing. So let's help, you know, to rewild and fortify these pollinator pathways. Um, so here, after all of that work, after all of that chain, this was the first batch of Eco Region 59, ecotypic, organically grown native pollinator seed. So you go like a woohoo, you know, really exciting. Yay. Um, and what we realized is, okay, but now we need to make this commercially available. So our farmers um, got together, Dina Brewster, the head at the hickories of those beautiful founder plots that you saw, and, and the other farmers in the Ecotype project, they started Eco 59, which is a farmer-led seed collective. So now those seeds are available in either 50 or 500 seed packets, but we also have, you know, seed balls you can see up there. That's really fun. If you ever won Straw Revolution, Masanobu Fukuoka, where you throw those seed balls out and they kind of make their own little garden that propagates um, beautiful greeting cards and mugs. You know, even if people aren't going to plant these seeds, they can still help support this really important initiative. Um, I know I've I've been talking already for 45 minutes, so I'll just I'll just take another few minutes so that we can um, have some questions at the end. But just you know, so we keep our seeds cool, dark, and dry. But native seeds you know, they, they're adapted to the natural landscape. So they have to go through what happens when those seeds blow off. Well, they sit in the soil and they go through the freeze and the thaw and the snow and the rain. And that's what they've been um, adapted. They have to go through that to be able to germinate. So to mimic that, you either put them in a, you know, moist paper towel in your fridge for 30, 60, 90 days, whatever that species requires, 
or you do winter sowing, another beautiful illustration from Wild Seed Project, take that seed, just put it right back out on the landscape. General rule of thumb with seeds, you cover it with much soil as the seeds are thick. Some of these seeds need a little bit more light. Our cards help clarify that for you. You can put some sand. Um, you put a bit of hardware cloth over it so the birds and the, and the mice don't get to it, but then you just leave it outside and let nature do its thing. Some of these seeds, you know, they're either like deep sleep or like a coma. They'll sleep for 30 or 60 or 90 days before they'll wake up or some will take two years because if they all woke up at the same time, what if it was a really hot or dry or, you know, bad season, that entire population would be wiped out. So it's just a true testament to the intelligence of these seeds. Um, in an effort to help spread the word and spread the seeds, uh, I'm a member of the Explorers Club and Wings World Quest, which is one of the leading organizations supporting women in exploration and science. And I started uh, the boat tanical expeditions. I say I'm not a botanist, I'm a boatnist because there's nothing I love more than paddling on rivers and taking native plants and my friends. You know, you don't have to go to the Himalayas to go on expedition, especially up in Vermont. There's so many beautiful places that need caretaking and stewardship in your old backyard. So how can we promote and realize again that we all have a role to play from farmers and gardeners and scientists and conservationists. Um, we paddled along the Connecticut River, the Algonquian term for the long tidal river. And the first year we went from the John Ledyard Canoe Club in New Hampshire to the Massachusetts border. And um, last year we went on Polynesian outrigger canoes and did the entire length of Connecticut, hiking through the woods to the farms that sit right on the riparian corridors to plant the founders plots. Um, you know, the other auckeries, mermockery, dispersal of seed by ants, ornithockery by birds, hydrockery by water, and anthropockery by humans, right? Um, let's not forget just, you know, the beautiful stewardship of place that, that truly once thrived on these lands. And when we partake in that, in that beautiful dance, when we put these, these seeds and these plants back in our landscape, then nature's going to do you know, do that work for us and help spread that along these areas. So um, next year we're going up to Maine and we're harvesting Zizania palustris, which is uh, not a truly native plant, but part of the ancestral foodways brought over from um, the lakes in Minnesota and the, the Ojibwa. And it was a, a very imperative food stuff here, high in protein and um, different anthropocentric influences have wiped out those large stands. So we're going to go and you harvest it by knocking it into your canoe and processing it, but that also helps reproliferate those stands to be more productive. So stay tuned from the botanical perspective. And um, that was our Polynesian outrigger canoes. You can see that we went on last year and I will share the PDF of this because these are the websites here. And then some of those um, more in-depth resources, those journals and uh, national seed strategies and all those things are linked here. And I really do encourage you to, to just you know briefly take a look at those because um, they're wonderful resources and we can all be in this together. So I'm so excited to hear that, you know, um, the Ecotype project is, you know, there, a model of it is hopefully in the works up in Vermont. And I would love to help answer any questions you all may have, but wherever you are and however small or big of a piece of land or however you can get even one seed into the landscape, it's, it's doing a lot of great work. So thank you all so much. And Wow, Sephra, thank you so much. That was uh, really exciting. Um, and just hearing it again is always great. Um, so I hope uh, all of you who are hearing it for the first time and enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, feel free to go ahead and, and put, your, put your questions in the Q&A uh, and use the Q&A function. There's no questions in there yet, which is a little surprising. Um, so maybe we'll give folks a few minutes to do that. Um, and in the meantime, I'll ask Sephra, could you talk a little bit about uh, wild seed collection uh, here in here, like how homeowners could do that or if they should do that, uh, go into the wild and collect seed? Yeah, I think as said before, um, wherever you're doing seed collection, you really need to make sure that you have permission, right? You need to make sure, especially on, I mean, if it's in your own backyard and if, you know, let's say um, if you've perhaps 
bought seeds from Eco Region 59, or if you just want to proliferate the seeds you already have in your backyard, if it's an, you know, feel free to collect those seeds and share them with your neighbors. And that's such a, that's such a fun thing to partake in. But if you're going out into the wild landscape, um, you need to really understand who manages that property. And you need to understand, again, those, those seeds of success protocols. Is that a truly wild stand? Um, do you know that you have the right species? We don't even do anything with rare species. That's an entirely different scope, right? So these are what are known as workhorse species, these traditional species that are broadly utilized across different types of habitats. But yeah, I would say it is really exciting. And, and if you can get an initiative or you can talk to whoever manages um, whatever shared land there might be in your town, wherever you are, you know, land trusts are a great resource. Um, talk to them and see if they would be excited about having a group of folks do seed collections to share. Now, would that be what we would put into an ecotype project on organic farm model if it was, you know, citizen collection? That's not our model, but the Native Plant Trust in Massachusetts does great training for, you know, citizen seed collection and so forth. So I think um, if you can look to who the right contacts, wherever you are, might be, then I think it could be a really fun thing for garden clubs and land trusts to do um, in pollinator pathway groups. But permission and knowing species identification is key. Awesome. So now we got some questions rolling in. Uh, first one is how are your seeds preserved? Um, well, we, uh, you, you want to keep, basically you want your seeds to stay, we put them in a fridge um, and you want, you want to make sure that there's like in, in the traditional seed banks, there's like the rules of 15s. You want it to be at 15 degrees, 15 degree humidity. And I'm losing the second. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. But what we do is we just make sure that you keep your seeds at a constant temperature. What you don't want to do is put your seeds in a position where they're going hot, cool, wet, dry, right? Because the seeds get confused. Unless you're planting them out in winter, sowing them, when you actually are storing them, we put a backup in our fridge that just stays cool and constant. We stratify, that's right? That's interesting. So we, we strat because you want to make sure you have a backup, right? Because that's what the traditional seed banking does. And then you would stratify some of your oh, seeds. Here oh, Brett, I think you're not on mute. Um, they, and then you would put some in like a wet paper towel to stratify them if you're actually going to germinate that amount of seeds and propagate that out for the next season. And yeah, so it's just a matter of, do you have your backup? Are you stratifying it? Or when we're putting it in seed packets for sale, we don't stratify what's for sale. We just take 50 and put them in the seed packet and keep them in a, a cool, dark, dry, constant temperature space to be able to send to you all. And then you would go through either the winter sowing or stratification process. So I hope that answers the question. But yeah, wonderful. Um, sorry about my interruption. Um, next, next question uh, is, is there technical assistance training for uh, beginning to grow out native seed? Uh, the person is thinking about both the native harvest and growing out the seed. I would look to, so the Wild Seed Project in Maine has the rewilding pledge and they do a lot of great um, information and training. The Native Plant Trust is an amazing educational resource. I can, maybe I can put the link, but they teach courses all the time, both virtual and I think they're doing in-person ones as well. Um, and they, they are kind of the Mecca of native plants um, within the Northeast. And so I would just look to their course catalog and I think you will be, you know, delighted. And there's also, of course, you know, New York Botanical Gardens, they do a lot of education and training on their portals. We, um, twice a year, we do something called seed school. So we bring together the expertise from around the Northeast and teach to different facets uh, whether it be the seed collection or the propagation or from a farmer, um, you know, from the, the Eco 59, the seed collective perspective, we try to cover the gamut. Um, also a good thing to know about is New York NOFA. They do their Northeast Organic Seed Conference every other year. So keep an eye open for that. They do a lot of great seed literacy uh, within their programming there too. But I would contact Native Plant Trust. Awesome, and I think that answers uh, another question, somebody asking about Native Plant Trust as well. 
Uh, so we'll we'll continue moving uh, with uh, are you uh, slash is anyone think uh, starting to think about? Sorry, this is a bit of bit of tricky wording. Uh, is anyone starting to think about needing to take seeds from other areas to match changing environmental conditions on the ground, or can we depend on local native plants to persist? Um, I think obviously there's like a lot of debate and conversation around that. From what I've heard, you know, my mentor says he takes a seed in one hand and his iPhone in the other, and he says, which of these has greater intelligence? You know, the seed ever adapting, ever changing since time immemorial. So I think if we can have these seed sheds that are preserving these, you know, huge arcs of diversity, let's not underestimate the, the intelligence of these seeds because there's something embedded in them that has already been adapting to those slight shifts and those slight changes in climate and what's and what's around. So I think, you know, if it does become a point where we need to be looking to the plant materials from a different ecoregion, at least if each of these ecoregion has a hub and a resource where they've been amplified and safeguarded, then that's a lot better than where we are now, where they're almost just never available. So Brett, do you think that addressed the question? Do you have anything you would add to that, Brett? I think that uh, addressed the question pretty well. Um, and, you know, as you always say, Sephra, the right plant in the right place. Uh, so, you know, the best, uh, the best solution that we know of right now uh, for building res resilient landscapes uh, is truly local native seed. Um, and anything else is, is not as, is as of yet uh, unconfirmed. Um, I, I, can add, I can add one more thing to that. There's, um, I watched this wonderful presentation from this uh, scientist and uh, well, botanist in Germany. And what she's done is she's been studying founder plot diversity. And what she's found is that actually planting these plants in a founder plot setting is increasing the amount of diversity. Because if you think about it, those plants would never be so many in such close quarters. So now that interplay around them is creating even, even more arcs of diversity. So she hasn't published it yet, so I'm not allowed to be sharing her slides, but what it's, it's really exciting work. And I think it'll be a, a great testament to showing um, the efficacy of, of having this type of a seed amplification strategy. Awesome. Uh, next question we've got is, uh, how can we tell if our plants are really ecotypes on our land? Uh, this person lives on land that has been farmed for 200 years, and they're, they're saying, who knows who brought seeds in and when? Uh, you know, even this could apply to Joe Pye weed. I think that's a really great question, and it's really an interesting thing that we look to the, the botanists and the natural historians of the area, you have to do some research and history to look back at the, you know, the, the landscape and ecological records of those areas, which is why it does become difficult for our seed collectors to be able to identify these truly wild stands. So I think um, for wherever you are, if there's was ever aerial photographs or any sort of documentation of that landscape, you kind of have to start to do that research to be able to make that determination. Now, again, there if it's your if it's your on your own landscape and it's been there for 200 years you know that scale of permanence that we showed we're not trying to say like don't do that unless it's the perfect thing no if you're doing this on your home scale or on your home farm for your own purposes that's that's fantastic and you know that seed is well adapted to your place but our model is for more you know commercial amplification to be able to provide for municipalities and be doing it on that larger scale. Um, but yeah, I would say re-proliferate that along your area. And, and yeah, I think, I think that's great. Wonderful. Uh, one of, one of oh, our, uh, go ahead. But, but, the, but the question about, is it truly ecotypic? That honestly, with more funding, like have the actual genetic tests and studies been done to compare it? No, is that kind of one of those goals that we have? Yes, so yeah. I knew there was something else I wanted <laughs> to address. <laughs> uh, our next question uh, is, is related to a news story somebody shared and I'll, I'll just uh, share the, the, the headline real quick. Uh, dairy farmers lobby against banning pesticides that kill bees. So uh, uh, dairy farmers in Vermont actually lobbying against the removal of pesticides that kill bees. Uh, and and the, the person's wondering, uh, you know, to what extent 
uh, is this a problem? Uh, and how, how is this a problem for bee conservation here in Vermont uh, for native bees? Is there anyone who can speak to that more articulately than I can? I honestly, I don't know. I do not have expertise in that arena, so I won't. I won't pretend. To, but I. But I'm glad. I'm glad to know about that. Um, certainly, oh. we work with our state entomologists, and we have them doing studies of of what native bees come back. Our our um, mountain mints are just a great home for a lot of native bee species, but I don't know. Brett, do you know? I can't answer that. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll refer this person to uh, uh, one of our earlier speaker series uh, webinars with Emily May from the Xerces Society. Uh, and, and in that webinar, she shares her email. Uh, and, and this would be a really great question for her. Uh, yeah, so you can find that on our YouTube page. Xerces Society has endless amazing resources around that. And yet yeah, Emily May has been a great friend of the native plant working group that we're all a part of. And um, yeah, that is the right person. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next question is, are there any issues with saving seeds that may have been developed by plant breeders? Uh, any proprietary issues? Uh, so I guess this person's asking, uh, you know, can I collect seed from, from plants that I've planted myself? Uh, yeah. The answer is, it depends. And that's what that open source seed initiative and the Safe Seed Pledge talks to. Um, when you're reading through seed catalogs, all of those little um, like symbols and abbreviations, that talks about whether those seeds are patented or not. And that is what predicates whether or not you can uh, save those seeds or not. So. Um, for our purposes, we're not working with you know any patented seeds because we're working with those F0 uh, seeds from wild populations. But when it comes to agricultural crops, if you've bought seeds from a company, you need to check their seed catalog and check with them to see if there's um, any patent on that in terms of being able to save and even replant or share those seeds. Definitely, you want to check on that. Awesome. Uh, what was the biggest challenge you found with growing out seeds on farms? So uh, can you talk a little bit more about how that was done? Sure. Um, there's a whole bunch of different challenges. Um, you know, seed collection is, it's a, it's a huge job. And so our farmers have been, you know, even seeing if pruning them to keep them shorter, right? Because those Joe pie weeds and those Renonias, they get super tall. Um, so it's a challenge to know, you know, with the asters, when you try and collect it, 90% of the seeds are just falling directly to the ground. Do you put landscape fabric down or not, right? If you're not actually really paying attention in those establishment years and a whole bunch of weeds grow through um, for some of the lower lying species. And when you do your seed collection, it's getting mixed in with a lot of other seeds. If you don't have those more high tech cleaning machines, the winnow wizard helps but being able to separate out those weed seeds from the seeds that you're trying to collect. So I think what's been the greatest challenge is learning what the different, you know, personalities and propagation strategies are for growing these out. Like the milkweeds, when we planted them, just milkweed, milkweed, we got huge aphid infestation, right? Because those milkweeds, you actually want to let those other weeds kind of grow up in between it because they need that to be supported and to do well. So it's really been getting to know the characteristics and, and from a, you know, a farming perspective, how can we be producing the most amount of seed? And then we do our germination test and some of our germination and viability rates on some of our seed lots are really, really low. And some of our other farmers are collecting a whole bunch more seed than we are. So I just think that there's so much that we still have to learn of how to do this most efficiently and effectively. And that's you know both a challenge and a really great opportunity because if we can figure out a replicable model, then we can, you know, now Rhode Island just started their own version of the ecotype project. There's folks in Massachusetts who are now getting founder plots going. Um, great people out on Long Island, Polly Wiegand, Long Island Native Plant Initiative. So I think the more of us that are doing it, the more we can, you know, Michael Butts at Greenbelt, he's like the genius guru of, of doing this type of work. So yeah, it's just learn as we go and uh, yeah, make these seeds available. 
Awesome. So we just got a, a few questions left uh, if we're going to wrap up for the night. Uh, do you have any connections at UVM for this project? No, but I bet Brett would be a great person to help make those connections. <laughs> There's there's some great people in uh, Franklin County. There's you know there's there's a lot of interest and and a lot seemingly happening in uh in Vermont. And if I could put my feather in you know Brett's cap to be to be carrying on the great work of the Ecotype Project, um, you know a lot of what my role is is kind of weaving together a web. Um, not claiming that I'm an expert in any of those disparate parts of the supply chain, but helping to say. What are the resources that we need? Who's already doing this work? What are we missing? And how can we weave this all together? And so really for any of you interested in this work, find the seed collectors, make sure they're trained, get some more organic farmers who are excited about producing a really um, in high demand specialty crop. Um, having seeds on your farm is great. You just need to get a seed seller's license and find nursery growers who wanna be a part of this. And then you're off to the races here. Awesome. And our, our last question, um, could you tell us a little bit about your work in Ukraine? Sure. And it looks like, Brett, you already have a connection at UVM. Just came in on the chat. <laughs> the system works. It's like the, the mycelium wood wide web of, of ecotypic native plant materials. Um, sure. So we, my twin brother and I, we also run a, um, a business called the Readiness Collective with Doc D, she's an ER doc. My brother does disaster response and I do food security work. And we've been finding different fun ways to socialize um, readiness skills, you know, whether if that's, you know, we, we grew up going to bushcraft wilderness skills schools. There's the Roots School up in Vermont that I did the gatherers program at. If any of you want to go learn from the greatest people you can imagine, check out the Roots School. Um, but what we've done is just made medical certifications and what to have in the back of your car and how to pickle food more fun and palatable to be a bridge to a population that may not, you know, really be looking to learn those things, saying that the more skills you have, you're of greater service to yourself and your family and your community. Um, and so we do advisory for that locally for, you know, businesses and families. And then we were called over to help advise an insurance company that has um, three different businesses in Ukraine. And so what we did is we put together um, go bags, essentially, with, you know, Iridium satellite phones and trauma kits and medical kits and went over and hand delivered it to them to, to speak with the CEOs over there about what their needs were to help formalize what's known as a, a trigger plan. So you know, if things get worse, how you evacuate all your employees, what the best routes are, um, and just making suggestions in that regard, and also helping um, with the resettlement plans, because when people are displaced, there's a lot that goes into resettling from uh, of psychological and a medical and, you know, their kids need to go to school and their dogs, you know, a lot of people had to leave their dogs and there's just, um, a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration and, and advised on. So that's that's what we were doing. My twin brother's still over there now and uh, Doc D and I, we, we made our way back. So um, that company is Tactivate if you wanna follow along with that work. All right, wonderful. We're gonna wrap up for the night now. Uh, and we just, um... Uh, we just got a quick comment. Uh, if Sephra, if you could put the links, some links into the chat about the Roots School and, and the Ukraine info while we're wrapping up, that would be great. Sure thing. Let me just, yeah. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah. It's my job to, uh, to thank everyone um, and to wrap up this, this program. We're so excited to uh, thank Sephra for this great presentation. It was wonderful. I learned so much. Um, as always, um, this is the fourth webinar we've had and they've all been incredible. Um, I also wanna thank the Middlebury Garden Club for sponsoring this and the PPAC steering committee who helped to organize and publicize this tonight. I wanna thank Bethany and Brett for organizing and working on all the tech problems. 
uh, to Jan McCleary for reading the uh, land acknowledgement, uh, to the Rewild Mid Initiative at Middlebury College's Sunday Night Environmental Group, and to all of you who came, and I hope you'll spread the word. We're very excited uh, to see how the pollinator pathway has grown in only a few months here in Addison County, and we've it's just an interesting to know that there are people from all over the world on the uh, listening to this webinar. We've had so many people from all, all over the United States yeah, and other countries. Other countries. So um, thank you very much. This is about creating community, fighting climate change, and helping create habitats for pollinators. So please check the chat to see if there's anything else. Uh, there's, uh, I asked Brett to put in the links to some of the previous um, speakers that we had. There's uh, Donna Merrill, that's our first speaker, Emily May, Mary Ellen LeMay, and then the one that we just had tonight. So there's lots of interesting things for you to look at. You can copy this chat. If you see there's at the bottom, there's three little dots. You just click on that and say save chat, and then you will be able to go back and find those links. So I think we're all set. Thanks again to everyone who participated and uh, good night. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>